Hello, friends, and welcome to To The Point, the home services podcast that focuses on marketing and operational solutions to help you get better. Because if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Now, let's cut through the bullshit and get to the point. Everybody, how is it going? It's Chris, your host of To The Point. We have got quite a treat for you today. Day. We are super excited. I want to introduce my co-host out of our Charlotte office, Mr. Tall Paul. Mr. Tall Paul, can you say what's up to our friends? Chris, what is up to everyone out there? Um, Chris, I'll let you introduce our guest, but I will admit, you know, we've expressed that our purpose is to give and give information and share with our listeners and our clients and the people we work with in the industry. And as I prepared for this one, like I was the beneficiary. So I'm a little bit like, I don't know if the word fanboy is correct, but this is kind of a big deal for me personally, because as I was preparing, like I was fired up. I'm not like, I didn't almost quit Rhino to go start my own business, right? But That's good. I'm That's fired good. up. I'm so, so glad you're here. So thank you guys for flying in. Go ahead, Chris. Awesome. Well, so Paul was, Paul was at a meeting last night and, um, well, like three hours away and he was listening to the E-Myth Revisited, um, on his way back and sending me screenshots of things. So I know you were fanboying, but I'm excited to have, man, a legend in here. Actually, I got a couple legends sitting in here, which is fantastic. And their stories have are intertwined, which has created this beautiful outcome uh, and, and, and kind of come full circle for me because our audience is a home services audience, always listening for tips, tricks, things that they can do better from those who have already done it, been there, done that, not just from the industry perspective, but in business as a whole. And thankfully, our guests, I've been a recipient of that knowledge and that wisdom. So I'm equally a little bit of fanboyish going on here too. So before I go down the path, I just want to give a quick introduction to our two guests that we have. We have, I mean, well, well, let me start with the first one. We get, we have our my, my friend now, I could say my good friend, Ken Goodrich uh, of Gettle back in the studio. So, Ken, we're so grateful that you came back in. Yeah, thanks for having me. And then Ken was gracious enough to go to our next guest and say, hey, could you come and do this podcast with us to share with these with the listeners? And he's sitting here in my office right now, <laughs> and he is – I'm going to try and get some of these. And if I miss something, please fill in the gaps for me. A New York Times, New York Times bestseller, which I've been the recipient of the book – Inc. Magazine, number one small business guru. Is that right? Right. We have a Lifetime Achievement Award. Is that right? Right. <laughs> and a National Academy of Best Selling Authors. But I know that it's what you've, what you've done is so far beyond that because you've helped many thousands upon thousands of small businesses learn how to run a business because of what you offer with your books the Emith and the legend of Emith. We have Mr. Michael Gerber in the studio today. Michael, how are you doing, sir? I'm great. Thank you. By the way, it's not thousands, it's millions. Millions? We've got to, we've got to get the numbers right. I met thousands uh, every month. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I'm one of those. I'm one of Thank those. You. And the reason you're sitting in this office mm -hmm. Is, is, is a big debt to you because I applied some of the rules that I learned in that book. Because when I went into business, I had no clue what the hell I was doing. <laughs> I just knew that I was really good at building websites and doing internet yeah. marketing. And I was a nerd. And I thought, okay, I need to get it together. And so someone had referred this book to me, The E-Myth. And I read it. It's right here in my hand. This is the book. And this is right here. Why? I mean, it, it's come full circle. So it's pretty. It's a pretty awesome deal for me. So I'm so grateful that you're in the studio today. I cannot wait for our listeners to hear what you have to say. And then even more so with you and Ken both in here of what you guys are able to. I mean, I've got to hear some of the banter back and forth, which I love. I think everybody loves. This is typically how Paul and I will go. But a lot of times from that, there's so many good things that come from that banter back and forth, little nuggets that drop here and there. So I'm excited. I don't want to take a bunch of time. I want to get into it to be respectful of everybody's time. But Yeah, I want to stop you for one second. Okay. This is Gerber. <clears throat> First of all, you said something which is, uh, is so abrasive to me. Um, you absolutely have to stop saying this on your show from this day forward. Okay. Tips and tricks. Um, tips and tricks uh, might be a dog and a cat, 
But if anybody comes on here and starts giving you tips and tricks, shoot them. Fair enough. Lesson learned. You got it. I'll take that as an action item. Hear yeah, that. I'm, Hear I'm, that. From, I'm from Las Vegas, and the term tricks is a whole different, whole different deal. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> whole different deal. Yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah you, you, you don't want to listen to tips and tricks because tips and tricks are just bullshit. And you said it right out at the beginning. It's just what stupid people do <laughs> and call it wise. Well, what should, it, what should he call it? Now, well, knowledge you don't call bombs? it tips and tricks. You call it wisdom. You call it knowledge. You call it information, at least. But you don't call it tips and tricks. For God's sakes, anybody who does a tip or a trick has already lost the game. Well, son of a bitch, I'm off to a bad start here. <laughs> hey, you're learning or already. Or a good start. I'm a very s- beautiful. I'm Michael, I'm a very self-aware person, and... I wouldn't even have thought about it until you just said that. So thank you. I wrote it down, which means it has meaning <laughs> my, to me. My delight. Hey, what's a better word? Like, what's a sexier word? The there knowledge. Isn't, no, no, no. It's not a sexier Wisdom word. Wisdom. It's not a sexier word. It's a word that resounds within you to tell you Truth. that something is there I need to of, know. Of value. Yeah, yeah and you, you got it when you first picked up the book. And you first picked up the book when you were having the worst experience of your life. You just destroyed your father's company. And so you got something when you got that book. And that book spoke to you. And it spoke to a very important part of you. And that very important part of you said, holy shit, nobody ever said this to me before. I know you were, you were hiding in the bushes. You, just, you were hiding in the bushes watching me. And you were documenting me. And you wrote the book. You got it. So, so it's so when you say, tips and, you say tips and tricks, you understand you just got to swap that guy in the face. Oh, I mean, shit. it's just <laughs> so bad. It so diminishes the power of it because look what you've done, he's Ken. A, he's a demon. Yeah. Look, what, you, look <laughs> what you've done, Ken. I mean, look what you've done in your life, Ken. That's the point. That's not tips and tricks, Ken. I mean, that is so far beyond tips and tricks and that's why i say it's so offensive when somebody who knows better uses language that diminishes the truth of it i actually think i'm not trying to minimize what you're saying but i always felt like i'm the forrest gump of hvac i just always find myself in these right places you think that's what it is well, it may be. <laughs> it may be, but you always get there late. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Well, I can't wait for Michael to share his <laughs> wisdom and knowledge, and yes, and I hope he's you know I hope he doesn't hold back in this interview. I, hope, I really hope that he puts it all out there. This, suddenly, you're in a, you're in your own interview. This is so being good. Being interviewed. This is so good. When my wife hears this, she's gonna be dying laughing and being like, "Hey, let this me is let so me good. let me before we really get started, let me throw something out here." <laughs> so you know, Michael and I did a. Uh, keynote at together at the uh service world service world expo expo um in las vegas and uh you know as he was explaining the situation he had and and called it really it was my i believe he was talking about my tenacity to just get things done he said he called me a demon (laughs) So yeah, but wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, Ken. I didn't call you a demon <laughs> because of your tenacity oh. <laughs> to get things done. I oh, that's you, what that's how I'm taking it. Yeah, I, I, I want to hear. I'm curious. I called you a demon because you ride over everyone. You understand? You literally ride over everyone on your way to getting what you're determined to get. In a nice way. But hear me, forget about in a nice way, Ken. It's not about that. (laughs) Please, it's not about that. It's your intense about getting what you want. And so few people are. And so that's why when they heard that folks in Las Vegas heard me call you a demon, they applauded. <laughs> they, got, they did. They did. Yeah. They did. Like, well, this, guy, this guy has continued to dominate the city for so many years. He's got, he is, the, they used to call me the devil, right? That was my side name, the devil. And they were nice. You know, we're all You're a nice friendly. devil. He's a like, nice yeah, devil. Yeah, the devil, like, how do you come in here and just do everything you do? But then he 
validates <laughs> their word calling me a demon. demon. Yeah, they hated and his I, guts. And I had I mean, several, <laughs> several guys <laughs> want me to sign the book, The Demon. Was it a, was it a standing <laughs> ovation when they when this happened, or because then that would have really been next level? It it, it brought a little uh, it brought some excitement to them. <laughs> and tears. I love it. Well, <laughs> anyway, go on. So, which is well, so Ken came in earlier on the podcast and shared a lot of information, uh, a lot of good knowledge and wisdom that uh, he's learned growing up and running through people and to get to his end goal, which is one of uh, the things I respect most about him is. I believe that he has a laser focus on things that he wants and he gets it done. And there's no question on if it's going to get done, when it's going to get, it's going to get done, but he has principles and processes that he follows. And I, I Not tips and tricks. I said principles and processes. I said, Was that better? Yeah. 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 I really had to think through that. <laughs> change up my game yeah but hear me but you didn't say tricks and sticks or whatever (laughs) that other word was principles and processes that he follows i gotta get a damn this religiously and improves upon continuously so understand it's not static it's dynamic so he works on his companies continuously to the shock of people who have known him over these years how could somebody who was so successful be so absolutely determined to become more successful? Because he's not determined to become more successful. He's determined to get it right. And it's never perfect. Not to Ken, ever. And so he's listening all the time, watching all the time, feeling it all the time, hearing it all the time, and he hears something, and it just clicks in him. But it's not a trick. So he goes to work to systematize the process by which he is determined to produce a more significant result in the marketplace. Hey, can I bring up, can I, should I bring up the subcontractor conversation we had? Of course. So we're flying on the way here today. And we were talking to a gentleman that uh, may may be interested in a or may, may be an author of Vertical, and I and uh, and I said, you know, one of the interesting parts of this process is there's there's certain things that I wrote about in the book that I had planned to do, or I thought about doing, and I wrote them in the book like I did them, um, and then I got it all done because these are things you know it, it was a good example of a systematic approach to the business. And then I got the book done, and I went into my CFO, and I put the book on the desk, and I said, I don't remember what chapter it is in subcontractors, but I said, I need you to read the, the portion on subcontractors and implement that system in our business. So a little backstory. So we have, a, we have plumbing companies uh, as well as HVAC companies. In the plumbing businesses, there's a lot of subcontractors, concrete, trenching, tile, painting, drywall, all that stuff. And so we always had this challenge, and and Michael calls it a key frustrations, you know, and I'm always thinking about my key frustrations, where these guys, we would would put the jobs out and they wouldn't get tight bids on the subcontractor work, and then they'd always be surprised after the job, like, well, this guy charged me, you know, $1,000 more than what I thought. And... And I said, well, why didn't you get the bid before you started? Because I could, he, he couldn't get to it for a few days. We needed to start the job, blah, blah, blah. So in the book, as I'm writing, I'm thinking, okay, here's a subcontractor section. And I wrote about creating a subcontractor agreement for all your subs. And here's the key ingredients and all the legal ease you got to put in there. But basically what I said is you make a, an easy form where the guy has a checklist that says, I do paint, drywall, and concrete. And then it clearly says, identify how our people will estimate your work for you on our jobs. And then we're going to follow that formula, and then we're going to send you a PO. And you have 24 hours to accept it or not. We're going to send you a picture of the job and the PO. We've estimated for you. You said you want $6 a cubic foot or yard or whatever the formula is. And... Um, and then you got 24 hours to respond or go do the work. 
That way we don't miss the bid, all that stuff. So it took some time. You know, they had challenges thinking about it. But anyway, they got it rolled out. They got it implemented. And guess what? We have never missed a sub bid or our margin has been static ever since we implemented it. Think about that. What, what Ken just said is this is the extreme importance of this because Ken just described what I call working on your business, not just in your business. So Ken sat down and wrote this, his portion of the book, his chapter, based upon a principle, a process, a point of view that I've shared with millions upon millions of small business owners um, they all read it, but only a handful do it. They all read it, but only a handful do it. But that difference that Ken just described is a system that he could apply in every single contracting company in the world and that none of them know about it. <laughs> now think about that. Not one of them. Every single freaking contractor on the planet doesn't know that they can actually control their subcontractors by agreement, but in a way that has never been done before. And the result that Ken produced was constantly, consistently getting exactly the result they set out to produce every single time through contractors who never could produce a result like that consistently every time. Think about yeah, it. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. That's you got great. It. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. So that that is not tips, tips and tricks. Do you understand? What he just described ain't a trick and it ain't a tip. It's a rigorous process because he's so inspired by what he's heard felt experienced in the process of truly engaging the emit point of view in everything he does. And he's always constantly chasing being better. Always. Never stops. Never. Every time when I've flown with him in a plane, this is the second time, third time, fourth time, um, he, it, it astonishes me. The conversation is always about better. I understand here's a guy who's built a HVAC company and a plumbing company that is one of the top in the world. Yeah. Now, Ken doesn't think about it that way, but it's one of the top in the world. He goes into a market and he outproduces everybody. They don't know how in the world he does it, but he does. But hear me, now, with that track record, he's still constantly asking about how to improve it, how to improve it, how to improve it. He always asks me questions whenever we're together about something or other that's happening in his business. It's always astonishing to me because you understand he's got all the answers. Yeah. But hear me, he doesn't. Nobody does. So I got to ask, because I know how it would make me feel. How does that make, after all this time and millions upon millions... How does that make, is it still feel just as good today as it did even in the beginning when you wrote this book and you started going and speaking and releasing it? Does it feel equally as good to ha have to know that a guy like Ken who is as successful as him, constantly chasing being better, comes to you again to say, let me talk to you about this. Does how, what is, how, explain how that makes you feel. Well, do you want the honest answer Absolutely. or do you want the bullshit answer? You can give me both <laughs> if you want, like whichever one is the right one to, no. you know? Um, uh, it doesn't feel um, in any way what you would imagine it is. Okay. Because in that moment when it's happening, it's simply another experience that um, I was, for whatever reason, born to have, that there is an opportunity in front of me that I've never perhaps thought of in exactly the same way. And so... The same, um, the same delight or same interest that fuels the question fuels me in the process of looking at it in a new way. Okay. So I'm constantly looking at it 
through new eyes in a new way, but systematically approaching it in the old way. So it's almost as though you find religion and you've got it, and then you discover that it's bigger than you thought it was, and then you discover that it's bigger than you thought you thought it was, and then on and on and on. I'm not going to go on and say sure. that again. But you understand? And that might be the demon. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's what hits me constantly all the time. And it's what, in fact, those who come to me explain to me all the time. Because it's not like they're talking to somebody who already had the answer and now is just repeating the answer. They're talking to somebody who's engaged in it in a living, determined, passionate, interested way that is rare for them. Because most people are stuck in what we call old co. But that doesn't even mean old co in their business old co in their lives, they're not going anywhere. You follow me? I do. And a key thing that you had said that I have, it's interesting to think, if I'm thinking forward, the things that, there's something you just said that I've used many, many times in many, many conversations that has come from you, is Ken doesn't work in his business, he works on his business. Yep. And a lot of our listeners are probably pretty guilty of doing that, of working in their business and not enough on their business. 99% of them are. So, and that's what they want, tics, tips and tricks. You hey, hey, but, and let me jump into that point. Here's another story that kind of relates to everything you're talking about, including what you're saying. Saturday will be 20 years to the day. 20 years to the day to this event happened. I'm looking at the newspaper, and I have a company management dinner that night. And I'm looking at the newspaper when you actually read the newspaper, and it had uh, it had a picture of Michael Gerber, and uh, he was going to be at I think it was Borders Books in Las Vegas, right? And so I'm like, oh, I, I have to go there because I had never met him before, and I had modeled my whole all my companies after the book, right? And so so I went out and I. Got a new suit, you know, made him alter it right then. I got it in. I got me a tie, and I went to the bookstore, and I was excited. I was nervous, and I went out, and I went to see him, and I showed up at his book signing and meet Michael Gerber, and I was the only one that showed up. <laughs> so all the thousands of books, millions of books that he sold, he's there where people can come and see him. I'm the only one who shows up. And I get a captive hour with him, <laughs> just me and him. And we talked about the book. We talked about, you know, I got, got some better ideas, yeah. you know, just. Uh, but to that point, it's interesting how the information is there. You know, the horse is led to water, but you can't make him drink. Right, right. right. Yep. But 20 years, Saturday <laughs> will be to the day. I looked it up in my calendar. That's amazing. Dress, dress <laughs> to the nines. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, but it's true, absolutely true. <laughs> and I was sitting there at that table in freaking Borders, <laughs> and I've never done a book signing in Borders since, ever. Yeah, not because only Ken would jump up, <laughs> but I want you to imagine what it feels like knowing that you've sold millions of books and you're sitting a freaking Borders bookstore at a table <laughs> with a dummy little chair and you're waiting for all the crowds to show and nobody comes. And here comes it's amazing. Here comes Ken in a suit. <laughs> yes. Dressed for that occasion. <laughs> <laughs> that worked out to your advantage. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> well, I certainly hope so. so. Yeah, he's made so a fortune. He's made a fortune since then. <laughs> I'm sorry, Paul. <laughs> oh, no, no. I so was that the beginning of a friendship or did it take years to develop kind of, how did you guys commingle to get where you are now? So that I was too intimidated back then. <laughs> you know, I was, I was, you know, so awestruck and I was younger, but so, uh, so no, I mean, you know, I was there and I, you know, got to meet this guy that transformed my life and, <clears throat> and my business direction. And then, uh, 
five, six years ago, I was at an ACA convention, Air Conditioning Contractors of America, and he was a keynote there. So I got there early. I sat in the front and center seat. <laughs> Were you in a suit and tie and... I wasn't. I wasn't as spiffy as the first time. Okay, no, <laughs> you wouldn't do that again. <laughs> I was a sport yeah. coat, and so I, you know, I had my phone and I was taking notes. I still have the notes um, on what he said because he said some some new things. Right. The number one new thing I still remember from that day was your business is a school for your employees. Yeah, and I went right back and implemented that. <laughs> this is a school. So anyway, so then, you know, I, I waited the signing. So I waited in line and I let everybody go because I wanted to talk to him. And I get up to him. He goes, sorry, son. The, I don't know if you called it son. <laughs> sorry. Well, all the books are gone. I said, that's okay. I, I've got a few. I'll bet you I passed out 250 E-Myth books and E-Myth contractors over the years. But anyway, so anyway, I told my story. This is a great story. He goes, would you, would you co-author a book with me on the HVAC contractor? HVAC, yeah, E-Myth HVAC contractor. And I was, again, awestruck again. I was so honored, and I said, certainly. Now, I'm pretty good at implementing systems, coming up with systems, working on my business. I'm not that good at writing a book. So it, it took, I don't know, five times, four times longer <laughs> than it should have taken, you know? But we got through it, and we got No, it, it took eight times longer. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, he's always wanting it to be better, so he's like, wait, nope, I can keep going, keep going. No, better. he just wanted to get four words on the page. <laughs> you understand? So, and, and, yeah. then, and then as we're going through that journey, I said, hey, why don't we do the plumber book, too? And so we were... So I, I was struggling to get the book done, and, and in my typical thing, I, I overload, so I got said, okay, we'll do the plumber book too. <laughs> so we actually got uh, the plumber book comes out in uh, May. So it, it's the E-Myth Plumber, why most plumbers don't, plumbing companies don't work and what to do about it. Yeah. Yep. So it, so that comes out this May, this coming May. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So now we have the EMIT HVAC contractor. Then we're going to have the EMIT plumbing contractor. Why most plumbing companies don't work and what to do about it. And understand it's the um, 19th um, EMIT vertical book will have published, That's and awesome. we're on our way to 322. So there will be, when we're done, 322 vertical e-myth books by individuals co-authored with me. I'm the generalist. They're the specialist. Certainly. From each and every market that we deem to be worthy to pursue um, and tell the story, the e-myth story of how um, a Ken, a Jim, a Judy, a John, whomever, actually went to work on their companies having been inspired by the story and then created the seven centers of masterful attention in what they do and how they do it. And Ken works on that continuously in both those markets. Absolutely. So then they get to share their knowledge and wisdom. <laughs> you got it. Hey, let me, let me uh, on the plumbing book though, yeah. So let me tell you how I approached it. For, for those of you who've read the HVAC book, here's how I approached the plumbing. So I started HVAC. Well, I started HVAC when I was 10, but I, I started really owning a company in 1986. And I had done, you know, done all kinds of things, selling businesses, buying businesses. But in, it wasn't until 2001 that I decided to buy a plumbing company. So from 86 to 2001... I wasn't in plumbing, but I decided to buy a plumbing business. And so I really take the journey from that point on in my plumbing experience to, to present. That's how I laid out that story. But I'm going to tell you one funny story, and then we'll move on. So I buy a company in Las Vegas. So I, so I buy a shutdown plumbing business. 
uh, and um, I, they, they shut down maybe two weeks before I got a hold of it. So I got it, and I'm going to resurrect it. I got the employees back, and I started putting it back together. So after I closed the transaction, the agreement was they would bring their trucks over to my air conditioning business on Saturday. So, you know, I got my shorts and tennis shoes on, and I'd come over to the office on noon and Saturday, and the trucks were pulling up. And they were those big Isuzu cab over trucks, you know, where the cab lifts up and there's engines underneath and then a big box and, you know, and it was called Green Valley Plumbing. And it had a big alligator on the side of the truck holding the plunger. Okay. <laughs> and so I said, I'm going to try out one of these. I've never driven a big truck like this. I'm going to drive one around, right? So I'm driving the big truck around and, you know, frankly, it's uneventful, but I'm driving around <laughs> and I see the Porsche dealership and I had planned that day. I, you're like, I, sometimes you get this point, you just got to go buy yourself a toy. right? <laughs> so I'm like, let's pull in there. There's got to be a toy in there, this right? This is going to be good. So I pull in the big 14 foot box truck and I, and I'm trying to steer it around and I'm making a commotion because I can't back it in. Right. And I finally get it in. And as I'm pulling in, there's a whole bunch of the sales guys standing out in the lot like they typically do, right? Well, when I I finally park it, I get out, and they had scattered like cockroaches, right? Nobody wanted no, to help you. Nobody's there. I'm in my shorts and I think flip-flops probably <laughs> in my plumbing truck with the alligator with the plunger on the side, right? <laughs> so I wander in, and inside the showroom, there's no one there. Like, what happened to this place? And so in the middle there, there's a silver 911 Turbo S with an arrow kit, you know, the wings and stuff on Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Sitting in the middle of the floor, and it's kind of raised up, and it's got the yellow calipers for the brakes, got the big brakes, all <laughs> the stuff. I mean, it was beautiful. It was glorious, right? And I looked at the, the sticker, and it was 155000 And so... I look at it around, and I open the door, but no one's coming out to help me. I'm like, well. They think you're there to fix the toilets, man. I, I, guess, I, guess, I'm going, I guess I'm going down to Mercedes or something. So I walk out, and this guy runs after me. Just as I get out of the door, I go, sir, sir. He goes, sorry, uh, this is my first day, and they had me in training. Can I help you with anything? And I said, this is not your first day. This is your lucky day. <laughs> Wrap that one up. <laughs> what was the reaction? He was like, really? I go, yeah, how are you going to pay for it? I'm going to head you a check. <laughs> okay. Okay. I love it. So I love stories like that. Jeez. But when I hear that story, what's left out of that story is what actually happened. And so what actually happened is... He came face to face with the reality that nobody could imagine a plumber, a plumber coming in and buying a Porsche. Could not imagine it. It was completely out of their ken. They couldn't, well, ken. They couldn't <laughs> imagine it. Think about it. They couldn't imagine a plumber was actually a customer. So what they saw was completely different than what they had learned over their history of selling these cars. They couldn't deal with it, so they ran. Think about that. That's been happening to Ken his entire life. But hear me, it's been happening to myself my entire life because nobody can believe what I'm saying to them, they simply can't. That's why I say millions read it, but only some very, very extraordinary people actually do it. Because what happens, let me just say this, what happens is they let go of everything they know. And they enter into a completely new relationship with information, with story, with everything I'm saying, and I call that a blank piece of paper and beginner's mind. And that's what Ken literally has been able to do consistently in every circumstance, in every situation. So hear me, here's Ken and this kid in 
young guy <laughs> runs up to him and says, sir, I'm, I'm sorry, is there anything I could do to help you? And the guy, the kid has no idea what the hell's about to happen. But you understand, Ken didn't react the way anybody would react, which was be walk out. Ken decides there's another story about to happen. He's about to give that dealership and that kid the biggest astonishing surprise of their life, and then he's going to write a check for the freaking car. <laughs> Do you get this? That's what he didn't say. You should have seen when I drove the plumbing truck to get my jet. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, man. Just another yeah. knock. <laughs> you got it. So, yeah. so that's those are phenomenal stories. I can visualize that whole thing happening, <laughs> and I can see you getting out of this truck and your flip flops. It's dirty. You get out, and they're thinking, "Well, surely they had to have thought you were there to work on something. Surely they had to have thought you were there to work on something." <laughs> I never asked. <laughs> Jeez. Well, I think well, so. That's one go. of those perception is reality situations too, right? Because if you might you might see somebody who comes in, and if he's not dressed to the nines, maybe you think less of him because he's not dressed. Or when I used to talk to my um, my papa, my grandparents, on how um, a lot of times what you wore was like how what your wealth was. Well, my grandpa was a farmer, and he's always wearing overalls. Now they were fairly wealthy for back then, being a farmer, a lot of hard work. But my but my grandpa did not dress up in those clothes. Now he was also. Very, he was very business savvy for a farm, which you kind of have to be because there's a lot of, I mean, I mean, you're also banking on Mother Nature to give you good crops. But people would people would judge him based on what he wore when really he was very smart of course. And, and very business savvy yep. and, a, and a good guy, good heart, but he would wear bib overalls. Yep. Yeah, you, hey, you never, I always tell my people, my kids, I always tell my people, my kids, Never judge a book by the by by the cover. You just never know who you're sitting next to. I'll tell you a quick story. Am I telling too many stories? No, I man, guess you go. Cut it out. But listen. Go. So, uh, like 1999, I had sold some companies, and I decided I was going to take some time off, and I was going to take a couple years off. I was, I don't know, 33, 34, and uh, um, and I'm telling you. There's only so, so many times you can take your daughter to school and and, and uh, <laughs> go to the gym and go to the chicken place and have chicken for lunch. I mean, there's only so many times you can do that before you start to go crazy, right? So there was a lot of activity going on in Las Vegas in the land and, and the growth of Las Vegas. So I thought, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a little system together and buy you know, 20, 40, 60 acres of land at a time, put partnerships together, sit on them for a while and sell them and make a profit. So I didn't know much about it. Kind of, you know, I got some people who knew some stuff about it. I wrote my checklist. I put my pro formers together. I got a piece of land in escrow. It was uh, $1.1 million. And so... I set it up so I would raise some money for with partners and, and uh, I would manage the situation. So anyway, I find myself in Phoenix and I'm flying back from Phoenix to Vegas. And I'm sitting next to this guy and I start talking to him. And, uh, you know, he's he was in real estate. He says, yeah, you know, he's done a lot of real estate and he just retired and he worked for a company. They did lots of uh, real estate and mining and blah, blah, blah. And... Um, and I said, oh, I'm trying this new venture. Here's what I'm doing. I'm telling about the land, right? And so we talked for, I don't know, an hour straight. Uh, had a good dialogue. And he said, hey, I would be interested in looking at your investment. Uh, I live in Hawaii, and most you know, us Hawaiians, uh, Asian Hawaiians, Malaysian Hawaiians, we like to come to Las Vegas. And so if we bought into your deal... We can write off the trip, but you you have to pick us up from the airport. You have to take us to show us the land every time so we can properly write it off that we went to view our land. And I said, well, I assure you, it's not going to change. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> but it's I'll, land. I'll do that. So good. So the next day we meet him. He takes the thing out. He 
takes my performa out. He has a red pen. He pulls it out. And I was projecting a 22% internal rate of return. And so he took the, takes the pen. He crosses that out. And he puts 8%. And then eight? I, eight. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then I put uh, that we were going to leverage half. We're going to get a loan on half or something. And he crosses that out. And he's in zero. He says, okay, if you want to do a business with my, me and my group, Never put more than 8% on your pro forma. We don't believe it. So 8% is our number. Only put 8. I said, done. Uh, and then he said, we don't do debt. We pay cash. We wait it out. If there's a downturn, there's any challenges, we will um, we'll weather the storm. I said, great. <laughs> okay. He goes, okay, we'll take the whole deal. We'll take the whole deal. And, and I got a portion of the profit, a chunk of the profit to, to manage it, right? So he signed up right then. And we signed, you know, I got the paperwork to him. I mean, the guy came and took the whole deal, $1.1 million, And we eventually sold it for, I don't know, 4X or something. But so a, after that, after I, we got done, we went over and had lunch. I said, so what company did you work for that, you know, you worked in land? that you did all this land business. And he said, I was the, uh, you know, I was the right-hand man of the Koch brothers. Oh, oh really? <laughs> oh, jeez. So you never know who you're talking to, right? <laughs> and so this guy got, and I got this rapport going, and and he followed me around. We've done 12 big land deals, and, you know, I'll just go find them and put them together. And his people come in, and you know, I pick them up from the airport, and, Show them the land. Jeez. Wow. Luck, that's incredible. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Yeah, that's funny because that, <laughs> that, that was on the front of my performa. Was it? Yeah. I was going to go tips and tricks, <laughs> real estate investing, but I went with the other one. I love it. I have a feeling this is one I'm <laughs> never going to live down. Never no. going to live this one down. No, well, you certainly I will. I want to want to bring it back for a second. I love this. Are, these are great, great stories because again, it just reiterates that you can't judge a book by its cover and that you should always treat everybody with the utmost respect, I believe, and be kind to people, be good to people. I believe you get those things in return. Um, I want to, for our listeners sake, because I think there's some uh, tactical things that we can pull out of this that would be super helpful for the majority. Cause like you had, like you had mentioned, Michael, not a lot of people are in Ken's position because maybe they didn't put in the work. Most likely they didn't put in the work, but there's some that have the ambition that want to get there. And I think people can get hung up on like t actually tactically doing something, having a box to check. What do I need to do? And then it can be overwhelming on, okay, I've got all these things. Where do I start? So I think people sometimes have a, have a, a good ambition to do it. And then it becomes overwhelming and they end up doing nothing. But you do understand, and I hate to interrupt again, but you do understand the way to start is with the E-Myth Revisited. Because so everything, I did. everything we're talking about goes back to that book because that is the place to start. But here's the important thing. When you start that book, you understand it's going to provide you with the absolutely clear steps that you must take if you're going to go beyond the ordinary. And so if you're truly determined to grow beyond the ordinary, which I call doing it, doing it, doing it, busy, 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 you've got to understand there's a golden process that in fact is available to every human being on earth. Regardless including, of business. Including the Koch brothers, including... Ken, including me, including you, including every single person listening to us right now, there is a process that you can use to exceed your limits in a way that you've never imagined existed before. But it's right there, right now, in that very same book, The E-Myth Revisited, Why Most Small Businesses Don't Work and What to Do About It, that was founded in 1995, following the original book from 1986, which was the E-Myth, Why Most Small Businesses Don't Work and What to Do About It. 
that has in fact increased in sales every year since the day it was first published. This year, it sold more than it did the last year, the last year before that, the last year before that, on and on and on and on. And I'm telling you, if you do what Ken did, he read the book, he read it again, he read it again. 37 times. And then he did it. How many times? 24. <laughs> Ken, no, I'm not talking about how many times you've sold the business. Oh. I'm talking about how many times you read the freaking book. 37. 37, I nailed it. Yeah. It's 37 times. I thought he said 59 times, but uh, uh, that's my, my nature. <laughs> But hear me, he read that book 37 times. Can you imagine sitting down and reading the book that inspired you to grow your great growing, unbelievably, unimaginably successful company to read it 37 freaking times? Actually, actually That's, I just remember, it's 39. That's okay, where you 39 the times, 39. yeah. Okay. So That's, you both were kind of right. That's why they call him the demon. Do you understand <laughs> He's a demon because he does things in such excess of what ordinary people do that they're incomprehensible to everybody who's listening to us right now. It all started with that book. So this day, right now, every single one of you go to Amazon or go any damn well you please, place you please, and get that book and start reading it now. Absolutely. It's a neat, it's right short now. read. You got it. Read it, and I don't care if it's easy. Read the damn book. I'm, well, I'm it try, works. I'm trying to talk in those people <laughs> who are already talking themselves out of it, because being a guy that's not a big reader, yeah, this was a reading the E Myth for me. It, I had to literally sit and focus. I started it, stopped, started it, stopped, started yep. it, stopped, and then I what I did. Uh, there wasn't enough pictures for me. <laughs> so, no, so I started looking at the chapters that I felt like were important to me because I didn't know any better. Yep. that I felt like were important to me. And then when I found some things that I was interested in, I would go back and be like, okay, I need to read this other chapter to see what, you know, how, how to make this other part make sense. And then it ultimately ended up going back and reading the whole thing because right. that's what I should have done in the first place. Exactly. But I didn't know any better, so yes, I was just but, learning. But they do. The people who are listening to us right now are sitting with two people and you and Paul who know what, in fact, has happened as a result of what Ken's done in an ordinary business. Do you understand? Absolutely. There are all kinds of guys Absolutely. in HVAC and all kinds of plumbers on the planet who haven't a clue. But you two, right now, listening to us as we're speaking to you, step one, step two, step three, step four, just like that. And when you get that, and when you do that, it's going to blow your freaking mind. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty powerful. And it's 100% true, proven time and time again. And the book sales are indicative of that. You it got it. To, it continues to crush it. Yeah. But the company sales are even more indicative of that. Yeah. So here's Ken. <laughs> He's built his company and sold it 24 times. Hear me. He's built his company 24, Ken? Yes. Monetize, Tw mon monetize 24 companies. Yeah. Right. 24 times. Astonishing! It's uh, it's it is astonishing, and it's how he's placed himself as you know the a, demon, a, a, <laughs> the demon. That's that sounds like another book we got here, the demon. How to create a legacy in the trades? And I gotta say, the you know, demon I, of ductwork. <laughs> I gotta say, I, I don't, I don't, you know, I wouldn't say I'm uh, any, any particular, particularly uh, more intelligent than anybody else. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm a lover. And, uh, but I just followed the system. You know, I just kept it simple, stupid, and I followed the system. <laughs> the KISS method. Yeah. Um, so I want to – we kind of talked about this ahead of time before we jumped on air too, but I wanted to, to ask you, Michael, if um, – I do believe that we have some, some – and we talked about this too, Ken, is a lot of technicians who have stepped out from a company thinking they're going to go on their own and they're going to start a business because they know how to go and work on – Right. Heating and air conditioning systems, but they don't have the business side of it down yet. So, right. so as a, as a solid takeaway for them, I originally was going to ask you what your top 10 <laughs> rules for success are, but you clearly let me know that you've got your own agenda for that. And I would love <laughs> 
for you to share that with our listeners on what are some of the top rules for success from Michael Gerber. Well, let me, let me say that because I'm now in my 83rd year, on my way to my 84th year, and since um, I've now written, published um, over 83 books, and because we have sold millions upon millions, and because the Wall Street Journal just said most recently that the E-Myth has had the most influential book of all business books ever published. Think about that. That's the most influential book of all books on business ever published, the Wall Street Journal. And Inc. Magazine calls me the world's number one small business guru. guru. I'm not selling Michael Gerber. I'm telling you I've earned the right to say that if you don't hear me, listen me, and follow what I'm going to tell you right now, you're just unmitigatingly stupid. <laughs> hear me. <laughs> you just got your head in the dark place. Yes, <laughs> that so, is gold. So, yeah, so I'm going to tell you what um, my three most important. Three, please. Yeah, I can't wait. Three most important. First of all, first of all, um, we were born in the image of God. And it says that in your Bible, in my Bible, but it also says that in Torah. And Torah is the word of God. Now, understand, you can say, yes, but I don't know that. Yes, but I can't hear that. Yes, but I don't believe that. But I don't give a shit what you believe. Do you understand? <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand? It said in Genesis um, that man was built in the image of God. And I then take that proclamation and say that if, in fact, the world, the universe was created by God, and man was created in the sixth day, the very first human being, Adam, created the sixth day. And something serious going on here. Do you understand what I'm saying? Something is seriously going on here that we none of us can comprehend. But to me, what that said is if man is born in the image of God, he's born to create. Man is a creator. And if man is a creator born in the image of God, he's born to create a world fit for God. And so if man is built to create a world fit for God, then every single child from the day they're born has been born into that possibility to go beyond anything any one of us can possibly imagine. So those are the three things I want you to say. Man was born in the image of God. I didn't make that up. And if man was born in the image of God, man was born to create because God is the infinite creator, creator. Yep. of man and world and universe. It's incomprehensible. And if that's true, then what is it that man was born to create? Man was born to create a world fit for God. And without even knowing that, that's effectively what drives me continuously, day after day after day after day, to constantly discover within me the creator who is not me in the process of pursuing the me that in fact I don't know, but I am determined to discover. You too can discover that me Nobody ever taught us how to create as child children. Nobody. My mom didn't. My dad didn't. Nobody ever taught me how to create. I'm telling you that, in fact, you can learn how to create. It's your mission in life to learn how to create a world fit for God. And I'm saying to all of you, 
That's all that Ken's been doing all this time. And that's why he never rests. And that's why he's constantly working on his companies, on his investments, on his life to discover what his life is really here to pursue. And he doesn't even know that yet. But God willing, he will. And so will you. So thank you. That's my three most important things. That gave me goosebumps. <laughs> oh, that was good. That was, good. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank, thank you, you, gentlemen. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, I, and I think, I, don't, I guess I don't want to assume, but the, uh, I, I actually texted this to you the other day, Ken, is I'm, I'm a, uh, I'm, I have processes in place that I start my day with, and I had to create those habits to do it. And one of them is I, is I, I pray every morning and I prayed for Ken the other morning and then, um, and I shared it with him. And then we had a good conversation afterwards. Um, it's just part of who, of who I am. And I'm learning, I'm still continuously learning about myself, even as I'm in business and feel like I've got things figured out. I never feel like I've ever got it figured out. I feel like I'm constantly trying to, to do things to be better or to be better for the employees, be better for our customers, everything. But my day starts with that. It's my first step. It starts with prayer. It does. My wife's day starts with prayer. Luz Delia, who is the CEO of our companies, every morning begins with prayer. Every morning, and she could describe it to a T, what she does every single morning of her life begins with prayer. Now hear me, not prayer with quotes around it. Like everybody thinks about praying and they have this idea of what praying is. Every single day, Luz Delia does this. And I'm not going to describe it, but any single one of you who want to know what that is, all you have to do is connect with Chris, and Chris will connect you with Luz Delia Gerber. Absolutely. Who's the CEO of Mike Lee Gerber Companies. And Luz Delia, I'm making a promise for her will tell you exactly what her morning is there to do. And when she tells you, hear me, you're going to go deeper in yourself. And that's where you need to be. It's not outside, it's inside, because that's where God is too. Love it. So good. So good. I mean, it almost makes me feel weird to ask the last question, because that's <laughs> such a good place to... To kick it off, I have a, uh, um, um, I have a quite what I what I done was I asked some of our listeners um, once they knew that you guys are going to be on the podcast to s submit a question, and I have a question to ask you both. And my my guess is you're going to have different answers, but from the same source. Yep. So uh, I'm going to read this as is if you guys are okay with that. Oh yeah. <clears throat> um. So does your and and. This is going to be more tactical, but it says, does your, <laughs> does your marketing percentage go up when, when you're going into a new market? What is it if you have a percentage? And the, 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 the listener has heard different people give their opinions on what percentages, what the percentages of your budget should be. But I think what they're looking for is what is this percentage for you or what is, how we get to that? What's the best way to get to that number? I think is really what the, what they're trying to ask is... And let me respond to Ken's, um, because Ken, I'm going to pass that on to Ken, because Ken knows exactly the answer to that question. I mean, to the letter. I have no doubt. I have no and to doubt. To the letter. But that's why it's so important that you understand the difference between Ken and myself. Absolutely. Ken knows the answer to that question, to the letter. And if he doesn't know it, he'll tell you how to find it. Because that's what he does. Constantly, outside his company, not inside his company. Just like Ray Kroc was outside McDonald's, not inside McDonald's. You follow me? Yep. He wasn't inside the hamburger stand doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. He was outside the hamburger stand working on that hamburger stand to get it to the perfection that it was 
doomed to get to in order to grow 37,000 plus, plus, plus hamburger stands around the world. So Ken is doing just that. So Ken, respond to that question. <sighs> okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through a little journey that I think most people can understand in, in my industry. So after I read the E-Myth 39 times, I started to, you know, use a system where everything you do is innovation, quanti quanti quantification, quantification orchestration. orchestration. Okay? And I, I had practiced this. I knew it. So <laughs> you make me nervous. All right, so... So when we went to marketing, I decided, okay, I, I, I can't do marketing that, uh, I mean, I've, I can innovate it, but I can't quantify certain types of marketing, you know, mass media, this and that. And so I'm only going to do things I can quantify because Michael said innovation, quantification, orchestration. orchestration. So I went to work there, and, I, and we got very, very good at direct marketing. And uh, you know, I went to some classes here, and they want to keep them under 10% and all this stuff. And so I kept it under there. And we would religiously quantify our results every single day. Here's how many leads came in from this particular marketing piece. Here's how much it cost. Here's our cost per lead, cost per piece, cost, you know. And we were just diligently cost per sale, cost per lead. And we dug into this. We had a machine. And any number we needed to know, we needed to know. And we would make our adjustments based on that. And we got good at it. And we built a lot of businesses that way. It's not a bad way. Then when the uh, internet came in, pay-per-click and SEO, the analytics, they called it analytics now, not quantification. Uh, and it was the same thing. And, and we had better data, I guess. And we'd look at all this stuff. And you web guys would tell us all this bullshit. Like, <laughs> well, your click-through rate is this. And your this is that. I'm like, well, and I'm like, how much money do we make? Yeah. <laughs> yep. And, uh, you know, we went through all that Amen. stuff. And, Went through all that, uh, you know, went through all those things, and we got good at it because we followed Michael's formula, okay? If you can't count it, don't do it. Count everything. So, go through this process. Well, on this latest deal that I bought, Gettle, you know, Gettle was a big legacy brand, and it had some challenges, this and that. So, I go to, I find this guy, Roy Williams, who's, uh, you know, he's the Michael Gerber of, the art of communication and, and, and advertising, right? And so I get him, and uh, long story on how I got him to work with me, but he, he's, he says he agrees to work with me. You, you have to inspire him. You know, he doesn't, he just won't work with you. If, if, if he's inspired by your story and likes you and thinks it'll be fun and interesting, he'll work with you. But he just doesn't take every business he can come in. So anyway, I figured a way out to inspire him. After several months, it took me maybe a year to inspire him, right? So anyway, I get him, and I go, he says, okay, we'll start in Phoenix, and, uh, you know, we're going to do this radio buy. And I had never done radio before. And he goes, now listen, I don't work with any limp dicks. <laughs> so either you're going to be number one or two in Phoenix, or I don't work with you. <laughs> And I said, huh? I go, I said, how much does number one cost? <laughs> <laughs> he said, million dollars. Are you in or are you out? And I thought quickly and I said, well, I guess I could always cancel it if it doesn't work. <laughs> I don't have a million dollars. I said, I'm in, right? So he said, good. That's what I wanted to hear. So was that outside of your percentage? I didn't know what the percentage was. Okay. A million dollars. Oh, it, yeah, it was, it was, you know. The numbers didn't make any sense. I had I had no method to quantify. How are you going to decide if someone? I asked. You know, he had little check marks. So did you did you hear us on the radio? And six people said yes. You know, and but we did a whole bunch of business. So I, it's very difficult to quantify that. But anyway, as it turns out, so we got it going and we got scale and we we, you know, we we built a brand and and we've talked about this before, but. The missing formula to my rigid innovation, quantification, orchestration was 
the, the piece that Michael also taught about, which was marketing in his seven centers of manage, management attention, uh, which was the brand and what it stands for and what it's about and how does it make people feel, right? Yep. And, and so this was my step into that. So long story, you know, if you're going to go into a new market, so, so I, I just bought a company in Texas and uh, they don't do HVAC, they, they do plumbing. And so we're going to piggyback our brand, HVAC brand on top of them. And so we met with the market, their marketing people. <clears throat> and they said, so, you know, what's your budget? And I said, I want you to tell me how much money it, it costs to scorch the earth in San Antonio, Texas. I want to <laughs> own it fast. How much does that cost? That's my budget. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, in that particular case, you know, when I start out, the marketing percentage may be uh, 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 140% of revenue. But as we come in, you know, my I endeavor to get it below 6%. Now, I wouldn't suggest as people listen to me with the smaller businesses without some scale, 6% doesn't make sense. But we start getting, you know, where your 6% is millions of dollars, you can make that work. Now, the old, the, you know, kind of the staple number is... 10%. Right. The, the other staple number is when you're in a new market, you know, maybe you nudge it up to 20 for a while. Um, but the challenge is, is that you don't have that numbers in such in flux. It's 20% for a long time if you don't have a sales system and execute on your leads. Because you could spend the same amount of money. It could be 20% or 6% depending on how much you sell. Yeah. Yep. Let, me, let me speak about <clears throat> Just what Ken said. Okay. Um, he said we started out direct to the consumer. Um, what you've got to understand is Ken has never departed from direct to the consumer. With Roy Williams, Roy Williams' expertise in telling stories is all about direct to the consumer. And that means that the person who's hearing it, seeing it, feeling it, etc., suddenly experiences the difference between what Ken is saying and what everybody else in the industry is saying. And it has nothing to do with air conditioning. And so you'd have to know more about that. But hear me, if you're setting out in your market to become number one in your market. And you should never set out to become anything other than number one in your market. Amen. But you don't have a pot to piss in. <laughs> you understand it's not the pot and it's not the piss. It's not how much money you've got or don't have. It's your determination to discover what your story is. And that is already the most important thing any business owner could ever do. What is the story you're here to tell? Why is it so important for you to tell it? And it has to do with being human in an inhuman world. You hear me? I do. Being human in an inhuman world. One of Ken's greatest stories is the story that he tells about when he was 10 years old Flashlight. as a kid working for his dad. Yep. You get it? Iconic, yep. That's the guy who's talking to you. They get it. He's got it. And the guy who did his stories got it. And they repeated this story, repeated this story, repeated this story forever and on. So it's the story, stupid. And that story better become a system, stupid, or you're back to being stupid, stupid, <laughs> and nobody wants yeah, to be that. That's a very good point. You know, we, we have manifested our story into a system. Like, for instance, I think we talked about this before, but, we, you know, we, we had um, flashlights. You know, my 10-year-old boy on the flashlight, we had uh, the old Rayovac flashlights manufactured. Right. And, uh, you know, we say in the ads, we're going to give you a flashlight if you – if you're a customer or you just see us on the road, or you see us at the gas station, just ask for a flashlight. And so 
we've given out over a million flashlights in all the markets. Hear that. Hear what Ken just said. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> the flashlight. The flashlight. Now, who has the guts to actually become the largest purveyor of flashlights <laughs> in their market? Who has ever had the guts to do something like that? But you understand it's the heart of the story. Yeah, so it's it's the system. So now we've passed out a million flashlights with our name and URL on them. Red button. And the red button. And we, you know, we get continual calls on the flashlights. Hey, I know you said this is the last question, but I see this really good question I want to answer. Sure. Which on, on the... Um, the one that's I have what, to what you. Do, what do you advise for service companies to get through the slow season? Yeah. Okay. So this is gonna this, I just, this here's a little wake up call. So, if one of my managers call me and says the weather is perfect, I don't have any calls. My standard answer is, I didn't call you for a weather report. <laughs> your job is to sell some shit. That's your <laughs> create, job. Right? Create weather. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, what we've done over the years is we created, okay, here's our shoulder season offerings. Here's all the different things that are best to sell in the, uh, in the shoulder seasons. For instance, IQ, duct systems, insulation, tankless water heaters, you know, uh, all of this, the things that can better somebody's house. Uh, or their family's lives, and we focus on those things. Next thing you do is you got to get in front of the customers. So you have to build a service agreement base so you have visits. You yep. know, so you have up to bats to talk to the customers about your products and service and improve their mm -hmm. lives. I mean, you know, so I would say in many years, in many cases, we've actually made more profits in the shoulder season than we do the summer season because we're not as hurried. We're not as rushed. There's not too, so much demand. Um, just this January, we're, th from this January, we're 87% up year over year. We've grown. This is not with the acquisitions. This is just our Organic. same store growth in January, which qualifies as a shoulder season, right? Right, in, in the markets I'm in, there's, Here, for there's, sure, yeah. Yeah, there's no snow, there's no, there's no weather. Right. Um, yeah, we're 87% up. From? Because we go out and sell shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because we go out, we've, we've made a plan, we've made a plan, we're going to make see this many customers, we're going to talk about these many things, we're going to hear, we use our, we create our own rise selling system, create a relationship, inspect the conditions, um, uh, create solutions, package solutions, and execute on closing objections. And they execute those, those processes with each and every uh, product that we sell. And a certain percentage comes out with a sell with an average ticket. But to sit back and sit, to sit back and say, I don't have any weather and say, woe is me, is just lunacy. And it's not the answer. One last thing, let's say this. So I, I read the book, and I, and I read the book, and I absorbed the book, and I carried the book with me in my back pocket. And I, and I found there was days that I wouldn't accomplish anything. And in my mind, after reading Michael's book, an accomplishment for that day was to build a system or implement a system, right, inside the business, identify a key frustration so we could build a system, you know, work on the business. But, you know, you're in that point where you kind of have to do both. So I went to the hardware store and I got a little mirror, I don't know, 12 by 12 mirror, and I put it by the door in my office. And I just disciplined myself to every day to look at myself in the mirror before I left and say, did you accomplish something today or did you just waste your time? And, you know, at first, I got more wasted times on my scoreboard than I did accomplishing. And so, and that led me to, this is why I'm here. 
I, I have to accomplish something with the time that we have to, to get this machine built. Because sometimes your worst enemy could be the person looking back at you in the mirror. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. But you understand also along that line, and of course we've gone far beyond um, our um, reason for being here. <laughs> this is but good under, stuff. But, but you understand the minute you say that we only have so much time, you have to look that into the in respect we only have so much time in our lives. So the very first step in the e myth revisited, we call, I call, your primary aim. Your primary aim has nothing to do with your business. Now, everybody who reads the book skips that chapter. It's, it says nothing to do with my <laughs> business. I ain't going to pay attention to it. Everybody, hear me, everybody. In fact, every client, and we've, we've worked with over 100,000 clients at Emith, the company, and Michael E. Gerber Companies. Um, nobody wants to do the first <laughs> thing. And I said, you don't do the first thing. You don't get to do any of the others. Because every single one of the others depend upon the first thing. The question is, what are you going to say at your own funeral to everybody who comes to hear you? Now, when I say that question, you understand people hear that and they say, what do you mean I'm dead? I can say. Yeah, and that's exactly the point. So what you're going to do then is to make a recording of what you're determined to say at the end of your life. You don't have somebody come up and speak for you. You speak for you. Because if you don't know what you wish to say about your life, you're never going to be able to live one. And so sit down and simply do that. And then live that every single moment of your day. And that will give you goosebumps if you truly do it. Hear me. So Ken's working on his business, and whether Ken gets this or not, Ken is working on his life through his business because to the degree Ken does for his life, what he's doing for his business, Ken's life will be transformed. So he, he hasn't even gotten to that point yet, but I believe he has. So in that particular point at the book, you know, that, that I was stalled. I'll say I was stalled for, I don't even remember the time, a couple months maybe trying to figure that out. And it, and it came to me, and I just, my primary aim is... I want to be a complete man, meaning father, husband, mentor, businessman, success, mentor, leader. And, you know, I listed, you know, I, there's more, but I listed those things. And that's what I identified as complete man. And ob obviously the, uh, the adjectives, is it adjectives or adverbs that <laughs> describe those? But... You know, I, I didn't list those. Like, I want to be a, a great father. Got it. And a great husband. And a great mentor, you know? Yep. Yeah, the adjectives you're talking about describing it. Well, so, so that's what led me. That's what that one thing. And like he said, I couldn't get, I couldn't get anything started until I got that step done. Hear that. Did, it's really, really important you all hear that because it's a very rare thing. It's a very rare thing. So Ken is a very rare guy. Um, every single one of you, if you don't get Ken as you're hearing him, um, you're missing the whole point. Ken is an immensely rare guy. He works on himself, on it, on his life, on his business, on his, the episodes that he's pursuing mm -hmm. consistently all the time. He's trying to figure it out, trying to figure it out, trying to figure it out. When? Before he dies. Because when else is he going to figure it out? After he dies? <laughs> <laughs> you 
You got it. Thank you very much. Well, what I got from that was even if you're not a Ken Goodrich, you certainly can be if you have the right focus and determination. And you can certainly get a good jump start if you go and get the Emeth, Emeth Revisited, because this was, this book right here I'm holding in my hand was the driver and still is a driver of processes for Ken on his quest to be the best at everything. And this came from you, Michael Gerber. <laughs> so, uh, again, I've used this thing many times. So it, it's hearing, you know, Ken's story, hearing you talk about different stories is um, some of the different things that that you, you like your top three was way different than I expected it to be. Um, but it's something that is near and dear to me. But again, it all comes back to, even as I sit here and I just had this moment of reflection is it started for me right here too. Thank you. So again, if you want to get the E-Myth Revisit and, and you have so many variations of this book and there's, you have multiple con or different uh, types of companies that you've written this with too, where can they find all the different types that you've written? Can they go to, can we go to Amazon? Let's go to Amazon. Things? You'll find it. Just look up Michael E. Gerber, look up the E-Myth um, and you'll find it. You'll see it. You'll find your own industry perhaps. Or you might say, Michael, I've already done the E-Myth. I've already applied the E-Myth. So I want to become a guy just like Ken. I just would love to become your co-author in the industry that I'm in. Um, how do we get started and talk about that? So that's something if the listeners are, are interested in doing anything like that and you would like to connect with Michael, um, we can go ahead and facilitate that for you. Unless you go to, I mean, you have your website too, so they could, could go to Michael. Of course. You know, My, go, Michael at MichaelEGerber.com, MichaelEGerberCompanies.com. Um, RadicalU.com. They can do all of that. They can go to Ken's website. Ken? Gettle.com. Gettle.com. There you go. And what we'll also do when we make the post on this is make sure to put all the information to connect with you through those sources as well. So you're super. So make it easy. And remember, if you want to know what Liz Delia Gerber prays about every single morning of her beautiful life, contact her and you'll also be able to lead them to lose Delia Gerber. Perfect. I'm in. I'll do it. I'm curious to know. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, I cannot thank you enough. It is truly an honor, and I have so much respect for you both. Um, I mean, you could have done a lot of different things. You're in high demand, and you took the time to be here, and I want you to hear me say I am extremely grateful. I do not take anything for granted. The fact that you're sitting in here, I believe, was something that was – I've manifested for years in determination of just trying to make this business happen. And here we are. And I cannot and thank you. <laughs> thank you enough. Thank you. So Ken, Michael, thank you so much. Listeners tune in for the next episode. I can't imagine how anything else is going to top <laughs> what we just went through. I mean, this was really just scratching the surface of what we could have pulled out of this. So potentially we can have a follow-up. Don't forget the E-Myth plumbing contractor is going to come out in May. When it does, we will go ahead and also post that for, uh, for all of you to find on Amazon as well. So thank you so much. Until next time. Thank you for listening to To The Point. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please consider leaving us a review in the App Store. And don't forget to share with your friends. Till next time, kick some ass.